the Mundak Banishad is one of the main Upanishads in our tradition and the word Upanishad has a very very special meaning. Upanishads are those texts which come from the Vedas but they are the latter part of the Vedas, the part which is also known as Vedanta, the end of the Vedas. They are a part of that section that is known as Jnanakand, the part about knowledge. While most of the Vedas are about rituals, mantras and various uh, rituals and prayers. So Upanishads are a part of the section which touches upon knowledge. It's actually the end of all knowledge. There is nothing beyond this. The word Upanishad has a very special meaning and it is important to understand it. It is comprising of three parts. Upa means by, ni is near and shad means to sit or sitting. What Upanishad means is by sitting near, by sitting close. By sitting close to whom? What is achieved? By sitting close to the teacher. One <clears throat> attains knowledge. It's important to understand in this modern day and age that we cannot substitute this sitting near with YouTube videos, nor with online meetings, nor with Skype calls. Sitting near also implies sitting in the presence of. It does not say <clears throat> Skype calls or, or online meetings, while these may be useful, just as books are also useful, just as videos and websites may also be useful, these cannot be substitutes for sitting in the presence, being close to your teacher. Why? Is that so important? Why is this physical proximity so important? For those of you who know a little bit about communication, you may have heard that about 80% of the communication that takes place is at an unconscious level communicate through body language, through little gestures, expressions, micro-expressions. <clears throat> Our entire body is communicating, is sending messages. This is one very important aspect of communication. It is difficult for a teacher to communicate through a telephone, through, through Skype calls, maybe a, maybe a video call is an improvement on a normal telephone or audio call, but it's different from being in the physical presence of the teacher. Things like websites, books, 
online meetings are all very general. They are for a larger audience. A teacher is not able to communicate with you directly, one-on-one. -on -one. This is why physical presence proximity is of absolute importance. The teacher or the guru is a bit like a planet. The word guru is also used for the planet Jupiter. Planet Jupiter is the heaviest planet in the solar system. So what is the aspect of a heavy planet or a heavy body, a heavy celestial body, which always is very prominent? And that quality is gravity. Just as Guru, the heavenly body known as Jupiter, is the highest um, gravity among all planets. Similarly, the Guru, the physical teacher, also has a certain gravitational field around. When a heavenly body comes into the gravitational field of a huge planet like Jupiter, that heavenly body gets pulled into the gravitational fields and is irresistibly attracted to this heavy planet. Similarly, being in the gravitational field or presence of a teacher pulls you into this planet this kind of field, magnetic field, a field of attraction. And this field itself transforms. It's kind of like magnetism. It's a field and it can transform you. The teachings that come from a guru is what the Upanishads are made up of. All the teachings here are Shruti or Apaurasya. What does this mean? Apaurasya means that which is not human. It is of divine nature. Paur, paurasya means that is coming from the word Purusha or human. And a uh, is not, that is not human. So this knowledge is not of human origin. It is of divine origin. It is a Shruti. Shruti means that which is heard. It is heard when a sage makes his whole being into a year doesn't have one or two years, but the entire being of a sage, a meditator, becomes a year. And with that whole being, he listens. Listens to the wisdom that is pouring in from the entire universe around him. The universe speaks. Wisdom pours in. And that is why <clears throat> these sages, these rishis, were like antenna. You know, they had receivers. They were able to communicate with that higher power, with divinity itself. They never claimed that knowledge for themselves. They never said, oh, I said it. It is mine. 
I wrote this Upanishad. It has always been a revelation. It has been revealed. The Munda Upanishad, one of the finest Upanishads, is a dialogue between the sage Angiras and Shaunak. Shaunak goes down in Indian tradition as the perfect householder, the ultimate perfect householder. What makes Shaunak the perfect householder? Is it because he knows all the prayers and the chanting well? Is he very good at chanting? Perfect pronunciation? Is he performing all his Vedic duties punctually and on time? Does he observe all his vows carefully? Is that why he is a perfect householder? We must understand what a perfect householder is. A perfect householder is one who performs all his duties in all of life without getting attached. He is a witness. His center is always calm and focused on the higher knowledge. It merely seems like he's performing his day-to-day -day duties. In reality, he is always watching. In this Upanishad, Angiras, the sage, is a renunciate. He is a sannyasi or an renunciate. He has taken tiyaga. He has renounced all worldly objects. This is what mundak means. Mundak means shaven head. The one who has a shaven head is the one who has done tiyaga who has renounced all worldly objects. So, the renunciate sannyasi is the teacher and the perfect householder is the student. He has seen something, Shanak, and he knows that this day-to-day -day life, that's not all, there is something more. He is curious. He has got many questions. He is inquiring. And so he comes to Angiras. While in this particular Upanishad, the renunciate teaches the householder, in other Upanishads, the householders teach the renunciates. It is not implying that you have to become a renunciate, that you have to do tiyaga in order to be a teacher or to attain something. There are stories about Janak, great king Janak, who teaches sannyasin. There is a story about a housewife who is serving a husband who scolds a sannyasi and also teaches him. There are many other such stories <clears throat> where the sannyasis learn from householders. So do not get a wrong impression that you have to take tiyaga or sannyas in order to attain something. Shaven head or tiyaga 
is one path. The other path is the path of the householders. Both the paths lead to the same summit. If a householder learns how to perform all his duties, learns to live life as a witness, remaining centered and focused, then he too can attain that highest. person who performs Tiaga, on the other hand, if he does not do it in the right spirit, this can also cause a lot of obstacles. Both the paths are difficult. Both the paths lead to the same summit of mysticism, of unity, of the one. So with that introduction, I would like to begin the actual Upanishad. It begins with the peace invocation, as do all Upanishads. Om, may all our ears hear that which is auspicious. May we see that which is auspicious. May we sing the praise of the Lord and live a fully allotted span of life with perfect health and strength. May glorious Indra and Pushan, the knower of all, bring auspiciousness. May Tarkshya, who protects us from all harm, and Brihaspati, the great fountain of knowledge, bring goodness and auspiciousness into our lives. Om Shanti 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 In this invocation we ask for a fully allotted span of life with perfect health and strength This may seem contradictory to the idea of Mundak, the shaven head, for a lot of people, sadhakas and those who are starting out on this path, have the impression that this life is not worth living and it is a terrible place This world is a terrible place and it's best to get out of here as fast as you can. There is the idea that renunciation of Tiaga means don't enjoy your life. And such people aspire to have shorter life and to be free from this pain and suffering. But a true sadhaka does not believe in such sort of escapism. He is in the battlefield of life and he asks for perfect health and strength, a fully allotted span of life, so that he can use that life to develop spiritually, to attain higher states of consciousness. To imagine that if you have not attained something that you can take with you, then you come back to this plane and have to start all over again. Start seeking, searching all over again. Go through the same suffering. Go looking for a teacher, then there's a good teacher, there's a bad teacher. You're in the wrong tradition, you're unhappy, you're miserable. 
rather take care of this body and use this life to attain as much as you can spiritually because this is the only thing you can take with you spiritual wealth the pharaohs of egypt believed that they would take all these material objects and wealth with them to the afterlife we know better we know that that does not happen we cannot take our house our cars our family with us the only thing we take with us are our samskaras if we have purified ourselves and we have attained impressions of higher consciousness then these we take with us and these will germinate in the next life leading to a good birth with a healthy body so that you can continue from where you left off this will bring us wisdom goodness and auspiciousness and this is what we pray for while we do not need to repeat such a prayer mechanically to ask for health strength so that one can practice <clears throat> perform sadhana and develop is a good practice if it is done in the spirit you don't have to repeat the words but if you believe in that spirit and if that's the spirit of these words strengthens you and these the spirit of these words grows within you and if that is your prayer then this will be a very good beginning all of us can focus on these thoughts the spirit of these ideas before you start your meditation in your own words okay so i can take uh, questions now if anybody would like to ask anything or comment on this In that case we continue to chapter 1 canto 1 verse 1 Om Brahma as the first manifested one the designer architect and guardian of the universe taught his eldest son Atharva the sovereign science of Brahma the foundation of all sciences the science of ultimate truth was that which brahma taught to his eldest son atharva who transmitted that knowledge to angir first later angir taught it to satyavaha bharadwaj and satyavaha transmitted it in succession to angiras the first two verses <coughs> tell us about the origin of this wisdom the source of this wisdom is brahma first manifested one the designer architect and guardian of the universe brahma is one of the trinity one of the three gods and we must understand this is a symbol when ignorance is destroyed 
by Shiva or Rudra. The universe is preserved by Vishnu and knowledge is born through Brahma. That is the birth of real life, understanding what true life means. Brahma is therefore always given as the source of knowledge. This is the lineage here where Brahma teaches it to his eldest son, Atharva. This Veda from which the Mundak, uh, Mundak Upanishad comes is the Atharva Veda. It's the fourth and the youngest of the Vedas. It's also the most mystical of all the Vedas. It also is the Veda that gives us all the knowledge of Ayurveda and medicine and healing. It's important to understand that this Veda, the fourth one, the most mystical of Vedas, because when you really understand it in the sense of living it, <clears throat> then you become a true healer. and a master of the science of Brahman, Brahmavidya, which is the foundation of all sciences. This lineage from Atharva to Angir, from Angir to Satyavaha Bharadvaj, and Satyavaha Bharadvaj to Angiras, and from Angiras to Shravnak. This is a lineage an oral tradition or what we call parampara. For all those who are sincerely seeking not merely intellectual study or wanting to read books but learning to live this in their life must approach a teacher from an authentic lineage. This is called also the oral tradition. It's an oral tradition. It's not a Skype tradition. It's not a Facebook tradition. It's not a YouTube tradition. It's not a WhatsApp tradition. It's not a book tradition or a website tradition. Oral tradition means you talk to your teacher, you sit in the presence of your teacher and you acquire this wisdom, sometimes merely by sitting in the presence of the teacher, sometimes by observing the teacher, sometimes listening carefully to what the teacher is saying and knowing that the teacher a good teacher has your best interest at heart. This teacher, a good teacher, is not being nasty to you or rude to you or scolding you because he or she needs to control you or has, has some sort of ego issues or is a power maniac of some kind. But a genuine teacher will guide you in different ways. Sometimes it's a gentle nudge putting you back on track. Sometimes you need a little bit of a scolding if you don't get it. And sometimes a good teacher also has to be very firm. Who does that for you? Most people would not care to do something like that for you. Why would they care whether you are growing and developing or not? Who will risk making himself or herself unpopular? Only a teacher who has your best interest at heart. <clears throat> that 
practiced by the parampara or the lineage, the oral tradition, is given such great importance. It's an unbroken lineage. Those of you who say, I learned from Yoganand or from Vivekanand or from some dead master just because you read his books uh, cannot claim to be a part of that tradition. You can claim to be part of a tradition only when you have had physical proximity to that teacher <clears throat> or you're one of those very rare few who have done your work in the last life and in this life just had to remember it. There are such rare souls, very few, and they remember. They remember who they are. But the rest of us must go through that fire, go through the discomfort of having a teacher, a guru, who has that magnetism or that sense of gravity, that force that will pull you and hold you and will not let you go until you have transformed. If you're fortunate enough to meet such a guru or teacher, make the most of it because they are very rare. Any questions regarding these last two verses? Okay, in that case, I'll continue. Verse 3. Shaunak, the great householder, approached Angiras in a proper manner and asked, Upon knowing what, sir, does all become known? He is called the great householder because... He has seen something and that has motivated him to approach a teacher in a proper manner. What is this proper manner? There are many students who ask questions, who inquire, but do they do so in the proper manner? Many questions are asked purely out of in Curiosity. Sometimes questions are purely intellectual at a very intellectual level. Sometimes even questions are asked to show off. By asking a question you can show others how clever you are. This is not a proper manner. Approaching the teacher in a proper manner means... Approaching the teacher with respect and asking a question in the right spirit, spirit of inquiry, a genuine question. Don't ask a question if you already know the answer, just because you want to show how much you know. Indeed, to ask certain questions, you need to also know something. So, in a sense... It's a way of showing off. It's a way of displaying one's knowledge and allowing the ego to play out its 
desires. This is the incorrect manner, improper manner. But approaching a teacher in a proper manner is emphasized in many scriptures, also in the Bhagavad Gita. If you do not approach the teacher in the proper manner, you should not expect any answers or any kind of result. In the Bhagavad Gita, as well as here, the student-teacher relationship has been emphasized. And this relationship is based on respect as well as love. From the side of the student, there should be respect. If you do not respect the teacher, how can you learn from the teacher? And from the side of the teacher there is absolute unconditional love. Unconditional love does not mean that the teacher will just keep giving you sweet smiles and, and you know, sort of cuddle up with you and, and say, oh, how what a wonderful person you are. Unconditional love actually means that such a teacher will make himself or herself unpopular by telling you exactly what you need to know. Such a teacher will hold up a mirror to you and that can get very uncomfortable at times. When a student comes to a good teacher in a proper manner and addresses him, that is a very special moment, a very auspicious moment. Shaunak, the great householder, the perfect householder, has approached the teacher on Niras in a proper manner and asked a beautiful question. It's not, a, it's not an ordinary question. He asks, upon knowing what does all become known? There are many things we can learn and know. <clears throat> the libraries are full of books, websites, the internet are full of websites about all sorts of things. There's so much to know. But knowing what does all become known? Is it even possible that one can know everything? What does that mean? to know everything. Does it mean that you become a sort of a psychic and, and you know the contents of a book before having read the book? No, that's not what is meant. <clears throat> Knowing all means wisdom which will guide you through life. It will guide you in amazing ways if you trust and will help you in any difficult situation or in any difficult situation it will provide you with the guidance you require it does not mean worldly knowledge it means you develop the discrimination to see through everything and in a amazing mystical manner provides you with whatever you need when you need it and gives you exactly the kind of knowledge you need to know to help you in that situation. Basically, it gives you access to the infinite library of wisdom.
such a person no longer needs to read any books, no longer needs to study any websites, no longer needs to watch YouTube videos because <clears throat> he can read the book of life. And knowing that all is known. It's not as if this person has all the answers. In fact, it's the questions that disappear. Any questions about verse 3? You go to verses 4 to 6. <clears throat> there are two aspects of knowledge to be attained. The knowers of Brahman tell us that they are the higher knowledge and the lower knowledge. Of these, the lower science is composed of the Rig, Yajur, Sama and Atharvedas, phonetics, ritual, grammar, etymology, poetics and astronomy. The higher science is that by which the immutable eternal truth is made known. That which is invisible, ungraspable and without origin, that transcends all, having no eyes and no ears, that which is without hands and feet, eternal, all-pervading, present in all, very subtle, that unchanging truth is the origin of beings whom the wise men see. What is that knowing which all is known? Well, we already said, this is not about worldly knowledge. It's about the knowledge of the other shore, Brahma Vidya. There is a Paravidya and Paravidya. That knowledge which helps us with our day-to-day -day life. People learn a vocation. They want to have a profession. They go and become <clears throat> lawyers, doctors, school teachers, scientists, etc. This is lower knowledge. In the times of the Vedas, it meant studying the Vedas men studying phonetic, rituals, grammar, poetics, astronomy. This is what a well-educated person in, during the Vedic times studied. And these were considered the lower knowledge. So studying the Upanishads itself is lower knowledge. It's not higher knowledge. Contrary to what a lot of people believe. <clears throat> they believe that by just studying Upanishads and reading about Yoga Sutras or Bhagavad Gita, that they are somehow practicing higher knowledge. That is not true. This is still lower knowledge. It says so right here, verse 5. It also says so in the Shiva Sutra. It says Janam Bandha. Janam Bandha means knowledge binds. Not true knowledge, but this lower knowledge, this binds. A lot of people are very stuck on their degrees, so they become doctors and they get their masters and they get all sorts of degrees and they're very proud of their degrees. It's just one more thing that binds you. This is not true knowledge. This is lower knowledge. 
the higher science or the higher knowledge is that of the eternal truth. It's invisible and you cannot grasp it. You cannot see it or touch it or feel it. It's not some material object. But when you have purified the self and you come closer to your own eternal nature, then you understand that unchanging eternal truth and you become established in it. And such a one, only such a one, is a wise one and goes beyond lower knowledge. Only that which comes through direct experience is higher knowledge. Everything else is lower knowledge. Anything that comes through the senses is lower knowledge. <clears throat> it's important to understand the difference between Paravidya and Aparavidya. So many young people, so many meditators, so many people are stuck because they are not able to distinguish between these two. A lot of young meditators get stuck thinking that, that by, by reading books on Bhagavad Gita or, or, or studying the Upanishads, they have attained something great, that they are somehow on the right track. While this knowledge, this kind of lower knowledge may be useful to some extent, it is not useful to be stuck at that level. One must go beyond that. You have to go beyond the words. These dark words have no capacity to give you light. These are empty words here, these words here, this writing, all this is empty. This cannot enlighten you. So it's really absolutely critical to understand that lower knowledge or by reading books, knowing scriptures, you will not attain. So that's why the Upanishads say, neti neti, not this, not this. This can lead to a great deal of frustration, but remember that this frustration is what will lead you to the truth. That sense of surrender at some point of time, say, it's not this, it's not this, it's not even this, then what is it? It cannot be described. It's undescribable. It cannot be grasped. It's not that of the senses. It's beyond the senses. So we can only prepare ourselves. We approach the teacher with the right manner, prepare ourselves. <clears throat> and when we are prepared, things happen, things just happen. In a very beautiful, amazing, mystical way, things just happen. Any questions, comments, thoughts about 
the difference between knowledge and wisdom difference between anavidya and aparavidya Yes, Balaji. Now uh, you mentioned about book of life uh, by knowing which we know everything. Mm -hmm. So does it mean that uh, we understand one one is able to understand himself or herself? Then 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 they open up the entire wisdom of knowledge, uh, the infinite knowledge. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Basically, you need to know yourself. Most of us don't know ourselves. we haven't the faintest idea what we are really like our self awareness is so poor that it happens the very often that the teacher knows the student better than the student knows himself or herself and because of this poor self awareness we are lost in this maya in the samsara we are lost and that's why we go through a lot of suffering but as our self awareness increases we become first gaining knowledge about our own self about how the mind operates how the senses operate then we begin to understand how the world operates we understand the structure of the world we see it that's why it's yoga darshan we see it directly and then because we know our true selves all the doors open up to us it's like having a master key you know every door has a key but there is sometimes they, they you may have heard of this they have a master key which can open all doors so awareness self awareness is the master key with that you can open all doors and that's the same thing is saying knowing that all is known that infinite wisdom is all for you to have and when you have that you don't need all this lower knowledge the no knowledge even becomes a burden and a nuisance <clears throat> for most people who start out on this path they have a tremendous pride of their knowledge so people will come and say oh i have this and this degree i'm a doctor i'm a i'm a you know i'm a engineer or something and they're very proud about that i came from this university this elite university and all that they have acquired is ego ankara this is not true knowledge this is not wisdom so book of life means studying yourself studying your senses studying your mind studying your yourself and the world around you how it is made up of different layers and when you have that sharp buddhi that sharp mind that can discriminate very fine very fine things then you are a paramahansa what does paramahansa means it comes from the word hansa is a swan parmahansa da the ultimate the highest swan <laughs> swans there's a legend that says can distinguish and separate water from milk it can take out water from milk you know it's not possible to separate water and milk like that but parmahansa is that legendary mythological creature a swan that is able to do that and that is why a great master or one who has a very sharp buddhi is called parmahansa yes so shri ram based on verse 5 does it mean that only sadhana is a way to higher knowledge and everything else is inconsequential well i 
wouldn't say inconsequential. It can be of some use as a stepping stone, perhaps. But sadhana is the only way to higher knowledge. You cannot attain higher knowledge by reading the books, by studying grammar, or by studying whatever one studies these days, you know, medicine and law and things like that. This is not leading to higher knowledge. This is lower knowledge. And this lower knowledge keeps the world uh, active the way it is. We need that lower knowledge so that the world continues. The world cannot continue without this lower knowledge. It would fall apart. So that lower knowledge has its use. But for one who has the aspiration to attain the highest, such lower knowledge is of little use. For such a one, all he wants is direct knowledge or darshan. He wants to become a seer, a sage. He wants to hear the Shruti, the revelations himself. He wants that wisdom pouring in. He wants to become a year. His whole being should become a year. And that is possible even in this day and age if you want it. Which means uh, this uh, Upanishads and uh, Vedas are gently pedestal to reach the higher knowledge. I didn't quite understand what you meant. No, you, since you said even Upanishads and Gita is uh, lower knowledge. Yes. So is it? Uh, does it mean that uh, one 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 is uh, sadhak is using this as a pedestal to reach the highest? Yes, it's a stepping stone. Uh, as I said, the lower knowledge can be of some use as a stepping stone, but it should not become the purpose or the, the goal. Unfortunately, many students get stuck there because they are not able to distinguish between learning and unlearning. I'm throwing all these different concepts and then putting using different words, whether we use the words knowledge and wisdom, or we say paravidya and aparavidya, we say learning and unlearning. I'm using different ways to convey the same aspect that we have to learn to distinguish between these two. <clears throat> it's very easy to read the books and to learn all the Upanishads by heart. That's what people did. And some people still do. They learn all the Vedas by heart, the rituals. Some people I know who are studying Yoga Sutras learn them up by heart. This is of no use. When it comes to attainment, spiritual attainment, this is of no use. One needs to understand the teachings and apply them in one's life and integrate them in one's life. And that can only happen when it is done together with practice. If there is no sadhana, there is no teaching, uh, guidance, then that cannot happen because these dead words cannot bring you life. These dark words cannot bring you light. They have to be interpreted correctly. And that's why we say, that these should be interpreted and that's why you need a teacher. Otherwise, from your own ignorance, ignorant mind will read and will interpret in an ignorant manner. So the Upanishads also say that's the case of the blind leading the blind. So all those ignorant people who have read Upanishads and they become teachers of Advaita, they become teachers of Vedanta. They have not attained anything, they have just read, they know all the stories, they can entertain people with their nice stories. But that does not mean that they have seen, that does not mean they are seers. 
It's just the case of the blind leading the blind. So, in order to see, to become a seer, you need first to do a regular practice. You need guidance, un unbroken lineage. You need the right attitude, approach, the proper manner. You know, respectful, humble approach. Not an arrogant, egotistical approach to learning. And most of all, you have to be ready to unlearn everything that you have learned. And to understand that these are two different things. Learning and unlearning. Knowledge and wisdom. Paravidya and Aparavidya. Learning to distinguish this is the key to becoming more self-aware, getting discrimination, you know, becoming self-aware, so that you too can become a Paramahansa, the one who can separate water from milk or milk from water. <clears throat> when you are able to do such a fine distinction, such fine differentiation, then you have really attained something. Okay, so let's stop here. We continue next time. This is a very intense uh, Upanishad, a very beautiful Upanishad. And if you listen carefully and contemplate on these verses it can be very useful okay